Okay. Are we good to go? Yes, we're good to go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone um, from around the globe. And it is our greatest honor to um, have invited Dr. Do Coyle to be here. Um, Dr. Coyle currently holds a chair in language education and classroom pedagogies at the University of Edinburgh. She is known across the globe for her work in CLIL and her re research with teachers and learners led to the conceptualizations of the four C's framework and the language triptych. And, oh, <laughs> uh, and yes, and this uh, new book beyond CLIL and we can't, um, uh, we can't wait uh, for this keynote session. Let's all welcome Dr. Do Coyle. Okay, thanks very much for the for the welcome. Um, and can I say it's 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 an honour to be with you this morning. Well, it's my morning um, here in Scotland. Um, my only wish is that we were together in person because I love interacting, and it, I'm getting used now to interacting with my computer screen, but nonetheless, um, thank you so much for, for coming. And um, I'm looking today at um, plural literacy teaching for deeper learning for multilingual classrooms. And I'm really um, questioning, is it a craze? Is it about critical responsiveness or responsible active um, activism? Um, and so unfortunately i'm not there in person but um what a beautiful country um and a, a, a lovely island i'd also like to really congratulate both the organizers and the presenters i've never seen such a rich program on clil and bilingual education covering all sectors um so i really really um was fascinated um i wish i could have gone to uh, more sessions um, I noticed there are sessions on cognitive discourse functions, translanguaging, task design, professional learning as the absolute key. Um, so it's all very, very exciting. And of course, in the context of Taiwan um, becoming a bilingual nation and the ambitious 2030 policy, then um, it's all about the drive for bringing about change. But for me, what is absolutely critical in all of this is that we have our policies, but it's how we transform those policies into what happens on a daily basis inside our classrooms. Um, so that's what really, um, that's, that's what I feel my job is and always has been. And as a former teacher, um, I guess that once a teacher, always a teacher. And it's all for me around the experience that our young people have. Um, so, if we just take a moment, we, we are fully aware um, for, about the, the shifts, the, the turns and uncertainties, as I'm saying here, um, and COVID itself has really challenged us in many, many um, different ways. Um, I'll just go back. But nonetheless, um, even pre-COVID, there were shifts and turns, and the multilingual turn that is so talked about, I feel is gradually also now welcoming the literacy turn. I put that in in italics and inverted, uh, sorry, in in on uh, parentheses because um, it's uh, well, I'm hoping that that it will become very very strong. So we've got those demographic shifts about people movements. We've got post truth behaviours and values-driven education, it's all there. And of course we have bilingual education and CLIL. And as I was saying earlier, there is the hegemony of English and Englishers, and which brings a kind of threat to languages other than English. And I do feel that plurilingualism is about that celebration of bringing together all language. I, I tend to use language as a plural, because to me language is any languages that are spoken and used, and there are resources. Um, and so, you know, the slow pace of changing classroom practices, we know that, and the need for greater investment in professional learning. And we're really good at reflecting. And I love these two images because, um, especially the one on the right, you know, it's beautiful, the, the, the shimmering water and so on and so forth. And we're good at thinking, analyzing and reflecting. But why I prefer the one on the left 
is that it's got to be visible. We've got to see through all of those reflections. Um, and so I really want to make it clear that in this session, I'm addressing all uh, all teachers, both language teachers and subject teachers, um, secondary, tertiary, primary, generalists, and so on. Because I feel that now we have an opportunity to bring language together and to really start to change the way um, our understanding of how learning happens. And I'll go to my favourite from um, Ophelia Garcia, and she says, you know, bilingual education isn't like a bicycle where you've got your front wheel, whoops, you've got your front wheel as your content and your back wheel as your language. If only it was so simple, but it's not, we can't separate them. And instead, she talks about the all-terrain um, heteroglossic vehicle that we need, that all-terrain moving and shifting over the terrain, which is our learning. And we know that learning is complex. We know, I don't know why this is it keeps flipping on. Um, we know that it's complex. We know um, that it's um, that for so long, Clil was looking at content and it was looking at language. It wasn't really looking at integrated learning in the early stages, which is why it's just got better. In my view, it's got better and better, and we're ready to shift into the next phase. So if we're embracing multilingualism and diversity, how are we as educating, uh, educators preparing our young people? Now, this is the rhetoric that's around all the time. What are 21st century skills, which always surprises me because we're well into the 21st century already. We know about change. Goodness me, we know about change. But what are those disruptive questions? And by that, I mean, do we really ask what are the pedagogic principles upon which um, my own teaching is based? And we also know that teachers um, use many different pedagogic principles. You can't just buy into one, and I hope that nobody ever buys into it, to one way of doing things. Um, that's very much um, old style. Um, but more to the point, what do I want my classroom to be like, to feel like? And even more important, what do my learners want their classroom to be like and feel like? So it, has, it, it requires us to ask some really difficult questions that I don't often see being asked. Um, we know about the shifting sands of the learning agenda. We know that transmission um, is only at that surface level. Um, and then we looked into generative, and now we're looking very much at transformative, which is where the, uh, the bilingual and trilingual policies lie. And so it's from the knowledge transmission to meaning making, and I would say that that's one of the key areas that I want to focus on is how do learners make meaning? What is meaning making? Um, it's not that trans trans transmission of, of factual um, knowledge anymore, and it hasn't been ever. Um, so it, we're looking at, at dialogue and we're looking at languaging in more than one language because this notion of monolingualism needs, in my view, needs to be stamped out because um, our languages are our resources and we need to use them in order to learn, in order to deepen our conceptual and communicative understanding. And of course, the OECD produced a learning compass. Um, I, I, see that, that uh, resilience, which for me is one of the most crucial elements and been working a lot recently with pedagogies of uncertainty, uh, but nonetheless, we know what we're aiming at. So it's all out there. We've got ideas for what the future will be like. It's the big rhetoric, it's the discourse that's around education. But for me, where is it in our classrooms? So we take on the umbrella term of bilingual education and CLIL. And in the 2010 book, um, the uh, CLIL was defined as that dual focused educational approach, um, which is used for learning and teaching of both content and language. And that makes the assumption that in all uh, classrooms, there is both content and language to be learned. And that is that um, it's a focus not only on one, um, but on both. And I have to say that the four C's which came out of the, the CLIL book um, was created by teachers. I can remember we were on our hands and knees with great big sheets of paper on the floor. We were drawing diagrams and so on because we knew we had to make a starting point, which is um, where we were um, with the, the four C's. 
And what became really clear was that as teachers, if we accept, and this is a, a quote by Genesee, if we accept that language is a learning tool as well as a communication tool, then we really do have to reconceptualize what we're doing in our classrooms. And we know about discourse rich environments, but what are they? Um, and can I also, um, can I question linguistic fluency? It's not the golden ticket. For so long, um, a lot of our language uh, lessons and um, our impulse to be bilingual has been about linguistic fluency. Now, this is an issue which I'll come on to later because unless linguistic fluency is matched by what I'm going to describe later as textual fluency, we can't possibly meet any of those, oh, that's perhaps too extreme, it will be difficult to meet. No, I think I'll go back on my original. I think it's impossible to meet those goals for um, equipping our, our future learners. And also we're not aware of any evidence that grammatical um, form is a, and correction of errors in uh, grammatical errors is enough to develop oral and written language as the medium of learning. We also know that no model is for export, and instead of there being a model, it's around making those principles fit, um, the key principles of CLIL fit into the context in which it's uh, operating. So that um, may well be familiar to many of you. I've added the S on cultures for very good reason. Now, content, and here um, I really want to emphasize the content is um, really in all our uh, subject areas, including language learning as a subject, uh, we have to think about content. And we know there are different kinds of content, um, factual, conceptual, procedural, and metacognitive. And all of those knowledges require different kinds of language for learning and for deepening um, that they, the concepts and for meaning making. We know that the cognition, the CEPA cognition, um, is around those processes involved in meaning making and conceptualizing, using new and existing knowledge, problem solving, problem creating, higher order thinking skills, being creative, and so on. We know that bringing together content and cognition is a really, really good starting point. However, can I just say that, that this is very generalized? So, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, didn't particularly re relate to the kind of discourse that you might need um, in science or the kind of discourse that you might need um, if you are um, engaging your learners in literary writing or um, in geography. So it was very generalizable, but an excellent starting point. Because what does integrating learning really mean? Um, so if we've got different kinds of learning, which require different kinds of language, which require different kinds of thinking, how are we going to do that? And the one thing, uh, perhaps, uh, this is almost like a confession now, it's confession time, um, is when we're looking at the super communication, the triptych for me um, was, again, it was, it was worked on by teachers, by colleagues and so on. None of this has ever been um, single work. It's not possible to do that. And so the language triptych was, again, a really helpful tool. And in the 2010 book, Language of Learning is, is the, the, the stuff that we all know about, the key vocabulary, the terminology, um, the key phrases that you might need. That's the language of learning, and people are really good at the language of learning. We also needed language for learning, um, which was around enabling tasks, which should become increasingly more complex and challenging to be carried out. Um, so if learners are being asked to, um, to inquire, to do some research, to do group work, to uh, have a discussion, they need to have the language for how to have a good discussion. Um, and so that was, that was starting to really develop. But I have to say that in the early stages, language through learning was not particularly well defined. We just knew that as you learned, it was involving more and more language that was that was coming through. And now I can say, um, and this is where um, the, the, the recent thinking has now been recorded in the 2021 book, uh, um, is around that language through learning opens the doors to pluralistry. Because as learners deepen their knowledge, they need to deepen their understanding of the language needed to build conceptual meaning. And 
language of and for learning is not enough. We need to go much deeper into the type of conceptual knowledge of a linguistic progression, which is really where we were um, for plural literacies. We, we felt that this was, was actually where we were going. Um, and so you won't necessarily find listed in textbooks the way to do this, the, um, the, the way that cognitive discourse functions are significantly different from those taxonomy of higher order thinking skills. Um, so if we're starting to look at meaning making, then language through learning opens the door. As we start to look at the way that new language emerges through learning, we can't predict it. We don't always know what's going to happen because it's with the learners. And it requires us as educators to respond in very different ways. So it's not only the meeting of the new language, it's manipulating it and finding it's making it my own so that I, as the learner, can use it. Um, and also, uh, we've done a lot more thinking about culture um, because we know um, about societal values and the culture. The, um, the emphasis on culture was really to try and get away from stereotypical views of um, the language speakers of the vehicular language. However, as we've got more and more into plural literacies, we also realise that at the micro level, cultures are very much related to academic cultures. And in fact, there are books that are written about academic tribes and their territories because there are very subject specific cultures around different ways of thinking. And we have to ensure that our learners are actually um, involved in that because, let's face it, language is never neutral. So, the four scenes then were moving towards plural literacies, and it meant that um, the content and the cognition had to be articulated and languaged in ways which demonstrate not only intercultural awareness, but subject appropriate discourse. So, the question is. These processes are all about developing plural literacies, but how? And the four C's didn't really tell us how we were going to do it. It gave us some good ingredients, but it didn't tell us how. So the time is right now, because so much of our teaching and so much of our education is built on what we call the present past. So just trying to make things better. And I, I still love, even though um, it's now 20, uh, it was written in 2014, I love Fallon and Langworthy's um, small piece about um, the, uh, the change in education that's needed. And then we have Dalton Buffer who's done an awful lot of work in, in um, current the discourse functions. And um, she talks about this urgent need to transcend the understanding that conceptualizes language and content as separate entities. In other words, we're back to the integrated learning and instead think of them as one process. Now, that is not easy because so we just, we're, we're almost, um, we're, we're, I don't know, we, we're, we have this way of thinking that content is one thing, language is another. So bringing them together and finding the language for bringing them together is, is really critical if this is what we want for our successful participants. Um, and again, we want them to be proficient and fluent with tools of technology. We want them to design and share information. Of course we do. We want them to manage, analyze and synthesize multiple streams of simultaneous information. That's really where we can offer such a rich um, environment in um, plural literacies, um, environment for bilingual learning multimedia text, ethical responsibilities, and so on, so forth. So, where do we go? What are we doing? What's the guidance? Well, we know about seascapes, we know about landscapes, so I really want to start to focus on learnscapes, um, because we cannot, um, and this is where I have a slight problem with the way that um, certainly um, in, in my part of the world, we do lessons that are planned, they're planned for an hour, and you find out what your aims and objectives are, and you say by the end of that hour, you will have. Now, I appreciate that we have to have structure, and I'm not anti-structure at all, but we cannot always predict within such tight temporal uh, limitations what will be achieved. And to me, seeing the classroom as an ecology, a learning act, uh, ecology, those dynamic spaces where learners and teachers are engaging together in meaning making is absolutely critical. So I'm just going back now to the literacy's turn because I see this 
as possibly the link that is trying to bring together into one concept um, subject and thematic knowledges and cognition with languages and culture. So I'm going to read this because I, I really, really think this is crucial. We've spent a century of education beholden to this generalist notion of literacy learning. The idea if we just provide adequate basic skills from that point forwards, kids with adequate background knowledge will be able to read or write anything successfully. No, 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 no. that's not how it works. Most pupils need explicit teaching of a genre of special language conventions, of dis disciplinary norms and high level interpretative processes. Where is that in our teacher learning? So this is not about teachers um, not being fluent in a language or it's about that basic understanding of the way that language works alongside within um, understanding. So academic literacy, and I have a problem with academic here because it always sounds as though this is the reserve of the older pupils or, or students and those at university. No, 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 no. For me, academic literacy starts the moment a child, well, arguably starts in the womb, but certainly starts as soon as the child goes to, to, to school. And that has to be made visible across all sectors, okay? And so we have to start thinking about, so what is academic literacy in my subject area? And if I'm a language teacher, what are the academic literacies that I need to be dealing in? How about the genres and the fields and the purpose and so on? Um, and the continuum from, from the very basic everyday spoken language to highly specific subject specific written language needs a very careful design. So how do we teach a subject without making academic literacy explicit? Answer, we can't. And we know about basic literacy. Um, I was going to do an, uh, a, a mentor meter where you, you um, where people um, put into the uh, into the website and a word appears in terms of how we would define literacy. And for so long, literacy has been seen as learning to read and write in the first language. No, we cannot. No, that, of course it is part of that. But very quickly, it becomes, uh, it, it, it's got to be much more than uh, basic literacy um, into intermediate and disciplinary literacy through text. Because academic language is nobody, academic language is nobody's, and I, would, I used to say mother's, mother tongue. Now I prefer first language. So we have to learn it. And the literacy's approach can permeate not only subject disciplines, but also um, the, uh, the language itself. Because basically what happens is that we have to see language as a fundamental tool for meaning making, for that knowledge building, which is slightly different from it being led by a focus on the linguistic system. Um, and so we, what we're aiming for is textual fluency. Now, you might think, well, so what is textual fluency? I'm coming on to that. Um, and so we've got, we know about the four skills, but we also know that they're completely integrated. Um, and as teachers, yes, sometimes we have to take things out and really practice them. Practicing deep practice is really good. We talk a lot about that. We spent a lot of time really thinking what deep practice is. Um, but somehow we've got to get into textual fluency, and this has got to be matching linguistic fluency. So literacies, what do we mean then if we're moving towards plural literacies? Well, literacies focus not only on communication, that is, but others, so we're communicating our understanding and our meaning with others, but it's also about our own representation, our understanding, the meaning for ourselves to support and deepen thinking. And in a way, it's a bit like the mantra, how do I know what I know till I hear what I say? And so the more that learners articulate their learning orally or in writing or in movement, the more it becomes clear where the next conceptual um, I suppose positioning comes or if there are any problems, if there are any barriers, because plurilitracies in the plural are central to all subject thematic areas and all learning across languages. And the discourses are made up of things like genre, purpose, field, style, mode. And some of you may be thinking, 
Well, I don't know about genre, purpose, field, style, and mode, because that's very much in systemic functional linguistics and it's very much embedded in literacies. So that isn't that whether you know about these or not is it's really the focus of professional learning. Because if we're serious about creating bilingual communities, then for me we have to be serious about being for literate learners. And therefore, this will require some changes to the way that we organize our classrooms because literacy instruction has to be embedded across the curriculum and it the progression is really increasing um increasingly and getting more and more complex so coming to um the for literacies uh, model that we've been developing where have we been and where are we going the grants group um, formed uh, several years ago, um, thanks to a European initiative. And can I say, and I will, I will always uh, maintain that anything that is associated with my name is always um, is always come about through working with others. Okay, so it's not about um, a few individuals sitting theorizing and then handing it over. The Gratz group, um, and do visit the, the, the website, um, but the, the Gratz group was around bringing together people from all the different um, interdisciplinary and uh, the educators, the, uh, the teachers, the theorists, the researchers, bringing everybody together to have some really good discussions. And I, like, I do like um, this quote, I'll read it. Neither the theorization of learning nor of language on its own is sufficient. Once we get into pluriliteracy teaching for deeper learning, we cannot ignore the learning agenda. I'm not suggesting it's being ignored, but there's an awful lot that's written about general learning rather than just, not, not rather than just, but um, as well as bilingual learning. But for so long, the, um, the early days of CLIL almost ignored some of the learning um, elements. I'm not sure whether I've said that particularly well, but I think this quote really, really. Um, I think it. I, I think it's. I think it's a good one. So the theorization of learning, nor of language on its own, is sufficient to provide an adequate account of second language learning and using for contemporary times and second language learning and using. Here I'm talking about um, in bilingual classrooms. Okay, and also remembering, of course that learners um, will, the, the crucial element for me is the problem of the linguistic level of the learners. Um, I think the linguistic level of teachers is a different issue. What tends to happen is that the linguistic level becomes equated with what learners can understand, and therefore the cognitive level is often reduced. We can never ever do it that way around. It has to be always that the cognitive level of the learners, the age appropriacy and so on of the tasks and the material that they're using has to be maintained. And what we have to do is to find ways of enabling that linguistic progression to develop. And this is where, again, where texts come in. And this is all around the interdisciplinary approach to language and learning. So we set about then unraveling some of the key constructs that we felt were needed in terms of developing uh, the, the how, not the what, but the how of the literacies of CLIL of bilingual education. And we unraveled and um, just spent a long time discussing and working with um, teachers in schools and so on, looking at literacies, looking at languaging, looking at the meaning of deeper learning, knowledge pathways, how we join all this together, and the interrelationship between linguistic and textual fluency. That's what we, we've been doing over the past um, um, three years. And I'm fully aware that concepts such as deeper learning are very, very easy to say. All of these things are easy to say. Okay? And sometimes this is why in the title of what I'm doing today, you know, all these are crazes, oh, well, everything's deeper learning. I read um, this week in an article um, uh, the, the concept of profound learning. Yeah, fine. You know, um, 
so are these crazes or is there substance in it? And it can, there can only be substance if we know how we can operationalize these in the classroom with learners and that it impacts um, positively on what they do. So I've said, read this, it's a good slide. I love this one, it's a swain from 2006. So some of this, some of the sources that we're using have been around a long time. Subject specific literacy develops with a growing ability to express or verbalize subject specific concepts or conceptual knowledge in an appropriate style using the appropriate genre and genre moves for the specific purpose of communication. And remember, communication is not only with others, but it's also for self. This process is languaging, that is, using languages to mediate increasingly cognitive complex acts of thinking and understanding. So my question is, where is the space for our learners to language? What kind of tasks do we need to encourage them to language, especially if they may well be used to um, cultures where um, they may well respond to a teacher and so on, um, they may well respond to questions, but this whole notion of of actually leading the questions, of asking the questions, of using the language interactively in the classroom is a challenge. So she describes um, all of this as the process of meaning making and shaping knowledge and experience through language. So I would say languaging is core. Cool. It's, it's a fundamental dialogic tool. The great thing is that it's free, it doesn't cost anything, a little bit of time, um, but we don't have to. We don't always have to be spending hours and hours creating nice materials and so on. Languaging is everywhere. And the more that learners and uh, become accustomed to languaging their learning, and the more that they increase the sophistication of those tools over time for languaging, the more they will um, be able to deepen their understanding. So. What is a pluriliterate learner? So a pluriliterate learner is one who got who has an understanding of how language works, okay? How it makes thinking and learning work in different subject areas. When do we have these conversations with learners? Do we talk about the way that our brains function and the way that we need to practice? Practice the way that we need to memorize, the way that we need to um, constantly be asking questions and so on. And what about translanguaging? Um, I come very much from the school that says um, that monolingual environments, why do we insist on the monolingual environment? Now, I'm not suggesting that any language you can use to do languages whenever you like. You know that it's much easier, obviously, to function in the first language as a, language, as a, as, um, a, a person in school. We know that. So it's not a case, oh, just any time. But if you really analyze what translanguaging means, and I know there are sessions on this, you look at what Athena Garcia says about translanguaging, which does include some code switching, but it is for a purpose, then actually a pluriliterate learner will be provided with opportunities to develop textual fluency alongside linguistic fluency. And I believe this is the way forward towards deeper learning. Now, we know these definitions. We know that deeper learning occurs when knowledges and understanding are internalized and automatized in ways which enable the learners to talk about their learning, to demonstrate in whatever ways we're wanting them to do as educators, um, their learning of different knowledges in different discipline and thematic specific ways whilst transferring their learning to other contexts. Now, I could spend hours just simply analyzing that statement again another one that's so easy to say but actually requires an awful lot of analysis in terms of design and for me what is missing is that we have to encourage and build confidence in our teaching force to become designers of learning so this is where the design comes in so how, how, what are some of the basic tools for designing the learn and this balance between textual fluency and linguistic fluency? So um, there are four major activity domains that are common to every single um, discipline. 
and they are what we call learning pathways. So all learning involves doing, it involves organizing, explaining, and arguing. And when I when you see explaining there, it's not the teacher explaining, it's not the teacher organizing, it is the learner. The learner has to do, has to carry out procedures, has to organize their understanding and so on, has to explain. And if you look at those, those sequential causal theoretical, I do believe that cause and effect is the only might be wrong here, but I think it's it's the only one that is common um, right across every single discipline in the same kind of way. Consequential explanation, exploration, um, and arguing. Now, both explaining and arguing are two of my favourites because I don't really see that happening very much, mainly because the learners aren't given the opportunities to develop the discourse functions that enable them to explain and to argue appropriately. Because whether you're a historian, a mathematician, a scientist, um, a, a language, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of that. Um, whether you're a historian, a mathematician, scientist, language expert, it doesn't matter. We all have those subject literacies and some are shared, but some are very, very specific. Um, so the way that you would write, um, a science report would be very, very different from the way that you would write history reports. And therefore, it becomes really, really obvious that the language teacher is not there simply to serve the purpose of the historians, the mathematicians, and the scientists, because they all have their own ways of operating. So all of us as subject experts have to have those um, that understanding of what literacies are and discourses in our own subject area. And they're used because teachers are experts in those areas. They're intuitive and they're used. But how do we make them and how do we teach them and enable them to learn by our learners? And the lang language experts themselves have their own discourses for um, uh, creating text, for um, writing, for literary writing, for multimedia, for multimodalities and so on. So those are the four um, uh, domains. I seem now to have got stuck. I don't quite know what's happening. It's something to do with annotating. I don't know. I've clicked something. I'm not quite sure what's um, happening. Here. If you, I, I think you've clicked on the annotation on tool, and. Um, Somebody asked for something and I clicked on it to, to get it off my screen. And it now seems that I can't move on. Okay. Um, if you, perhaps if you stop your sharing and share it again. And reshare. Yeah, I'll do that. That would be able to solve that problem. Okay. So I'll, I'll try and share it again. Okay. Oh, okay, so um, Here we go. I'm not going to go on for very much longer, but um, basically you've got an example here of what doing science is like, what organizing science is like and so on. And every single, every single teacher uh, will need to think very carefully about what those domains are like. Because after all, language is not about words. Words are meaningless. The semiotic tools out of context. So with the keys to deeper learning, then they are the cognitive discourse functions. And here you've got a list of seven that Dalton Puffer um, identified. And you, you might say, well, some of these are, are similar to um, the, uh, the taxonomies that are already in existence, yes. Um, but the key thing with a cognitive discourse function is that it relates to the context in which it is being used. In other words, to the disciplinary elements of, um, of the learning. So here we have then the, how the cognitive discourse functions activate language through learning. So I'm going right back to what the kind of experiences, the kind of skills that our learners need to have. And here um, you've got you know, all the things about what is it like to behave like a scientist? And what is it like to behave like a geographer? What is it like to behave like a, a language teacher? What is it like? And we need to have these 
actually analyzed so we know what the discourse functions actually are. So I'm going to start now to wrap up in terms of the plural literacies um, model from the um, from the latest book. So the plural literacies approach then is around um, progression. It's definitely not equating learners' linguistic competence with their cognitive level. It uses text, multimodal text, oral, visual, digital, kinesthetic, if you like, whatever, encourages learners to select texts and connects first language literacies, task design, with that of second language literacies through advanced languaging. So, um, text. When I say text, I do not mean a little piece of writing with 10 comprehension, 10 comprehension questions afterwards. Text is the entry point of learning for our learners. And text can be written, of course, but it can be auditory, it can be visual. Um, and we have to start dealing with text. We have to start introducing text. We have to start enabling our learners to manipulate text because that's what they do on a daily basis when they're on their phones, when they're watching TV or whatever else they can do it. Um, and that enables us to start to develop the critical literacies where learners can start to understand what is, uh, they can start to evaluate what they're seeing and reading, which is crucial um, for us in our current world. So textual fluency to me, um, alongside linguistic fluency is the starting point. Textual fluency starts, linguistic fluency is not the only fluency that we want to achieve. And promoting textual fluency, what does it mean? Well, it means that for language teachers, we've got to shift from that grammatical chronology into a different kind of chronology, all right? Ling uh, literacies um, becoming increasingly more, more sophisticated. We've got to explore the meaning of text in our own disciplines, looking at genre, style, and register. We've got to take meaning making really seriously and connect with other language, uh, languages and so on. And above all, we have to rethink task design and sequencing. And so this is what we came up with. So this whole notion of constructing knowledge and through linguistic progression, okay, which is your, your literacies, and that is happening through the activities, the knowledge pathways, the doing, organizing, and explaining that are bridged by the uh, deeper learning or by the cognitive discourse functions. So they can see in a bit more detail conceptualizing it. So it's not the content. It's the conceptualizing, it's the knowledge building, um, not content, um, because content is flat. We're looking now at, at, um, at, at substance, looking at deep depth, um, facts, concepts, procedures, and strategies. And along the bottom, we have the communicating um, uh, continuum of communicating is not only for others, it's also for self. And we move then becoming more and more sophisticated in the discourses. So that's where we went uh, went to with the Polytrasis model, but what was missing? We had to square the circle and this is what was missing. So in other words, the learners and the teachers, the growth mindsets, the resilience, determination, the mastery, motivation, if you like, self-efficacy, and the teachers, what were the teachers doing? They're mentoring learning, not the learner. They are mentoring learning. And once you objectify learning and talk about learning, then it takes away the stigma of whether you've understood or not, and whether it's right or wrong, and so on. So this mentoring, learning, scaffolding, and creating those conditions for and designing deeper learning tasks were absolutely crucial. So we focused really very much, say, on the uh, like leading from the four C's and looking then at the uh, communicating and the knowledge building. But we also haven't to um, forget the crucial elements of the, the people himself involved. And so what we've done is called, uh, we've called the, uh, the knowledge building and the communicating, we've called those the mechanics. These are the cognitive linguistic processes. That deeper learning involves. So involves, evolves, involves, evolves. Um, so those are the mechanics, and articulating these processes enables us to see the pathways. Okay? However, we've now added the drivers as the factors that promote or inhibit the mechanics working. And that is around learner and teacher engagement. 
um, which led us onto Learnscapes again, bringing all of this together into Learnscapes, the ecologies, the nurture deeper learning, nonlinear, require four dimensions of the PTDL. So I'm just going to show you, just want to show you the four dimensions. There we have the four dimensions. So we've got the two that you've seen already in a slightly different format. We've got the communicating and the conceptualizing continuum. But down the other side, we have um, personal growth and mentoring. So designing PTDL landscapes, what teachers need to know? Well, they've got to know how to align the mechanics and the drivers. So that's kind of shorthand for going through all the stuff, just calling the mechanics and the drivers to enable those trajectories along knowledge pathways to emerge. And therefore, um, what we've done is really analyze what that means in terms of uh, complexity of tasks, practice activities, and so on. And there, um, what we've tried to do um, in the book, um, the latest book, that I've written with Oliver, and you can see Oliver, it's on the uh, right hand side back row. Um, and so myself and Oliver, whilst we put it together, it is a collaboration right across the board. And it is the concept and evolution of the PTDL. Um, and really, there you have that PTDL model where all four dimensions are fundamental to design and learning. We're fully aware that it doesn't go um, far enough. Those are all the principles we've really analysed how this learning happens. And there'll be, uh, we've just almost finished the follow up version, which is the companion volume written by the by teachers that is full of their materials, different subjects. Um, it's full of materials and lesson plans and demonstrates how they activated the model. So to close then, um, it's a, a 4D design. Um, deeper learning episodes occur when that alignment takes place. Okay, and the next steps. Well, we've got to demystify all of this. We all know learning is complex, but you know the emphasis on professional learning is quite exciting um, because it's shifting the kind of um, the the way that we are understanding language as a learning tool um, is shifting that considerably into literacies and positioning it in literacies. The early evidence is very positive, but of course, much more attention we need for uh, longitudinal uh, data. I've told you about the companion volume. There's critical inquiry. We always we're questioning all the time, we're refining and so on, um, all the time. And there's invitations to join the PTDL classroom inquiry network. And can I say that PTDL is not a panacea, but we see it as the next step along the way to developing bilingual education that asks those questions what goes on or what can be going on on a daily basis in our classrooms? And for that, um, doing, uh, professional learning is shared professional learning is crucial. Because I just I think the privileges is here to stay. So I wonder what your three takeaways are. I have no idea. I'm also um, fully aware that you can only ever concentrate for two or three minutes at any one time. So you'll have been drifting in and out as I've uh, as I've spoken. Um, I will make this available for anybody that's interested. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'd also like to thank all those people that have made it possible. For me to even talk to you and to write uh, to write the book with Oliver, because it's a thank you to the learners and innovative practitioners, teachers, educators who make this pioneering work possible. Um, and this is where we've got to. This is a, a, a slight bang up to date version of Clarence's teaching for deeper learning. And hopefully, it will enable us to um, understand better how we can enable our future um, global citizens to be. So, get in your vehicle, your all-terrain vehicle, and um, fly high. I love the eagle um, there. It's beautiful, taken from the island where we, uh, where we live, Scottish island. And in Gaelic, of course, Tabali, which means thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coyle, and um, I. It's this wonderful. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, um, so a lot. I'm sorry. Perhaps too much. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, 
I just think if you just give lots of information, people will take one or two things, which is why I said, what are your three takeaways? Yes. Because the rest you can read about, you can think about, but what hit you or what did you think about most um, from what I've said? So rather than systematically going through it and da 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 da, da then you know, we can read about it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I've tried to do, just throw things out and mm -hmm. see what hit you um, and what you what you think is if, if uh, you know what you think might be helpful um, mm -hmm. to take in the gender course. Mm -hmm. well, the, the new direction on pluriliteracy and uh, the four D model, the textual uh, text con uh, textual fluency, <laughs> you know, are are all the There's keywords so thing that people will remember textual fluency um, alongside linguistic fluency. Um, that's my uh, that's my hope, um, but it might not be the case. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I think we, we still have six minutes. Um, um, Joe was saying, could you mention the role of language teacher yes, in I can. the literacy con context? I certainly can, um, because this is very close to my heart. I'm just at the moment writing a, a piece on uh, how language teachers are subject disciplinarians, um, because uh, if we're looking at pluriliteracies and we're looking at text, then text enables us to um, deal with conceptual understanding, thematic um, understanding. It can be linked to literary text if we so wish. Um, currently, uh, actually in Switzerland, I've been um, following a teacher, a language teacher, who decided that uh, he wanted his learners to become literary writers and so uh, these were near beginner learners they were 11 12 years old and through a literacies development they learned um, how to create these amazing descriptions and uh, the description wasn't only physical it became uh, looking at personalities looking at emotions and so on and when they did a travelogue the travelogue wasn't just about oh what you describe when you go somewhere else it was around um, scenario building such as a company wishes to open a hotel on a particular island, which is likely to have an adverse effect on the environment. What are we going to do about it? Now, this to me is where we need to go as language teachers, which we, we of course, it's great if we can if we can collaborate with our subject teachers. But as language teachers, we have so much to offer and pluriliteracy is our op opening for um, making sure that it's not necessarily the grammar that's leading the way, but the grammar is supporting textual fluency um, as well as linguistic fluency. I'm not saying that they, you, know, you dismiss that. Um, I'd love to have a long conversation with Joe about that because it's something that is very close to my heart. But I think our literacy approach to language teaching and learning is just phenomenal. It's fabulous. Um, thank you. And there is another question about um... Uh, the second question, would a person be more aware of their own learning? And um, this other question from uh, Professor Liu uh, Wenyue, would you provide some comments and feedback about the application of CLIL in Taiwan? The application of, of CLIL in Taiwan, um, th this is very difficult because I haven't, um, I haven't been, I would love to come. Um, and I would have been here with you right now had we been able to travel. Um, it's it's very difficult. What I do know is that if it's only more recently that you're adapting CLIL, it's fantastic because mm -hmm. some of the I'm not um when when ideas start to develop, sometimes they uh, well by the very fact that they're early early stages. They, they need time to develop, to need to know what works well. Um, are we going down the wrong pathway there? Is that better? And so on. And so uh, the fact that you're now using the four Cs, uh, amongst others, I mean, there are many other models around, and I'm not precious about any of the models. Um, but for me, the triptych and the language through learning was what for us was the, the that was the warning bell that we hadn't got that quite right we needed to do more work on that um so i i would say that um for me my greatest wish would be that there's investment in teaching and teachers to enable them to um to be really practical about some of this stuff and as i say it is very very practical it might not seem it after my talk today 
but um, we're being involved with putting together the uh, the companion volume and seeing what other teachers are, are writing about the way that they're planning, um, designing their a series of lessons rather than just one lesson and so on and so forth and crucially task design so i can't comment other than to say it's actually you shortcut by mm -hmm. um not necessarily having been involved with that since the 80s and 90s it's great thank you um and uh dr our director dr chen would like to ask a question um dr chen can you unmute yourself okay. yes, yes. And uh, dear uh, Dr. Collard, we well, really uh, sincerely uh, appreciate your sharing and the guidance. Okay, and uh, especially uh, it gives us so much a great idea about, um, you know, uh, about clear. Okay, but um, you know, actually we uh, uh, read through your books. Okay, and I fully uh, uh, agree with your concept about uh, like. Uh, uh, conceptual learning or deeper learning, okay, and like a textual fluency and a linguistic fluency are both crucial for the academic literacy. Okay, now, uh, but um, the problem is, you know, the uh, how to say the uh, textual fluency for different subjects might differ, and uh, the. Linguistic proficiency probably is more easier for us to follow, but that you know we uh, try to implicate bilingual uh, teaching into the science maze, okay, um, or uh, integrated activity or visual arts. So we have a different subjects that we try to implement into a bilingual education. Now we are the teacher training. Uh, uh, you know, institution. Institution, right. We have a problem with uh, how to design a teacher, a teaching program for, you know, to, you know, have our uh, English teacher or subject teachers to uh, master or to really, you know, get the skill, you know, you know, to, to, to put the so-called texture literacy. We really, we don't, we have a problem to design a program. I don't know how to do it, you know, yeah. Uh I appreciate that, and I think it's shared with most countries because um, I'm always surprised that um, there is, uh, in terms of economy and investment, to me, investing in the teaching force is the most crucial thing that any country can do. And yet, across the world, um, where it, it's not necessarily the case. Now, I, I don't know about Taiwan. It seems that there is investment, but what you're talking about here, I think, is the nature of what we're trying to enable people to do. The problem is that that literacy approach isn't traditional. And so we can't fall back on it and say, oh, yes, well, that's how I learned. And also, um, if we've been successful at learning in the old ways, um, why should we change? So really, I think what we need to do is to be re really, really clear about the discourses that belong to uh, different subjects. Um, and at different levels, what, what those are around. And that, that is, um, I suppose, it's, it's systemic functional linguistics to an extent. Um, that's where some of that comes from. But um, if it's for English, I would strongly recommend looking at some of the fantastic materials that have been developed in Anglophone countries for English as an additional language. And those, those materials are superb because they are based on literacies and they're usually for migrant children or um, children whose first language is not English in Anglophone countries to try and, and get them integrated as quickly as possible. Um, but um, even saying integrated, um, that, that, that there would be severely questioned because it's around celebrating the fact that there are multiple languages. Um, so I, I think it's all around um, that knowledge of uh, literacies by the way, I'm not saying that linguistic fluency is not important. I'm saying that textual fluency is as important. Um, and also questioning the, the level of, of language. Now, I would rather have a, a, a teacher who understood literacies, who's, who was learning English and trying to get better at English, than I would somebody who was very fluent in English, but didn't have any, any understanding of literacies. Um, and um, sorry, I'm, I'm going over very slightly, mm -hmm. but I'll say that with our student teachers next week, um, we are doing science through 
British Sign Language, Gallic Medium, wow. French, and Turkish. Wow. Now, you might say, why Turkish? That is because I want the learners to, oh, sorry, I want my students to understand what it feels like if you are a non uh, speaker of a language and you're in a classroom where nobody else speaks your language, what the teacher can do. And so between now and next week, I have to learn some um, some Turkish. Um, so, you know, I, and that's only a, a little, little example. But what I'm saying is that it's around understanding the way that language works rather than the language system. And yes, you can't do one without the other, but we haven't spent enough, enough time focusing on how how the, the discourse um, needs to deepen in order for the concepts to deepen. Mm -hmm. So otherwise it will just be transmission. And yes. also the other thing is it will be teaching in the language rather than teaching through the language. And my hope, whatever model is being used in bilingual education is that it is always through the language and not simply in it with a few bilingual lists, which I'm So I don't know whether that answers the question, but I do sympathize very much um, mm -hmm. with the issue of um, professional learning and the, the need for that to, uh, to, to change, to shift. Um, mm -hmm. And just confidence. I mean, teachers can do this, um, so. Yes, thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Um, uh, we'd like to carry on this conversation, perhaps 30, uh, 30 minutes hour, um, during our Saturday Night Life with Do Coyle, Professor Do Coyle. Um, we have many more questions in the discussion. Um, please remember your can questions you, and bring you, your brief discussions can you in, keep in the them. Can, can you paste, can you keep yes. them from yes. the, the chat? Because I can't, I can't see the chat. I, the I will, and, um, and we'll come back. Um, um, and several uh, of us are holding our book, um, and we'll take a group photo at Saturday Night Life with Do Coyle. Um, um, and um, thank you for attending this session. Uh, please come back at um, 6.30. Um, if you have the book, we can do a really quick picture. Yay, look at <laughs> us. <laughs> can I just okay, thank, well, you, thank you all very, very, very much. As you can tell, um, I can talk and I love talking about this because I think it's, oh, look at that. Oh, so oh I have the, the other one as well, but I can't, I can't go grab it. <laughs> oh my God, so many. Thank you. Oh, Thank that you. is so Thank lovely. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, come back at Saturday Night Life with Dr. Do Coyle. And uh, okay. thank you, thank you. I'll end the session Sorry, for I now. see you in person. Bye. Bye. How can I have the book? Um, <laughs> Amazon, Amazon. <laughs> Amazon, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've purchased the bulk of, um, everybody's holding one of, Right before the conference, we're, we were so excited um, and we've read, um, so far we read chapter one together and we'll re keep on reading. Um, and yeah, it was so, yeah, we're so excited for this um, keynote and to be able to talk to Dr. Dole Coyle in person is wonderful. Yes, um, so let's take a short break and let, um, there's two sessions going on right now and we'll be back okay. in, in, in a bit, 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.